everyone, and we are in the beautiful waterside village of Southport, North Carolina. Why don't you walk with me and uh, let's talk about my thoughts on the Bible reading for this week. Since this Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent, is the Sunday we celebrate joy, it is no wonder that the epistle reading chosen begins with the word rejoice. Indeed, Paul implores the Christians at Thessalonica to rejoice always. Even as a kid with no experience of the darker side of life, I found ways not to be happy, and to be completely honest, Christmas for me is no longer a particularly happy season. Growing up, of course, Christmas joy was a lot easier to come by. I was blessed with an army of family members who made it their mission to make sure that Christmas was merry and bright for the children. And as grateful as I am for those warm memories, now many in that happy band have gone on to their heavenly home. They are no longer with us here below, brightening our days. On top of that, pile the personal tragedies that have accumulated over time, personal health issues, family members who have cancer, or have had strokes even in this last year, and perhaps worse, family members who don't feel that getting together for Christmas is worth the effort. Do I enjoy my Advent Bible studies, Hallmark Christmas movies, and how beautifully my wife has decorated the house? Yes, of course. But this is also the season in which I feel the loss of joyful relationships of old, and I feel them the most deeply. Christmas is no longer unmitigated happiness. It has become, for me, frankly, bittersweet. If you, like me, are not all laughter and smiles at this time of year, how do we hear the Bible's words, rejoice always? At least in this week's reading, Paul only said it once. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul doubles down on this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Before we mutter bah humbug and slam the door in Paul's face, let's look at this passage a little more deeply. In this week's reading, Paul is ending his letter with a command to rejoice, but he had also begun his letter with commending the people for their joy. He wrote, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Paul was expressing appreciation that even in their suffering, they had great joy. The Roman occupation had been especially harsh on them as they lost property and possessions to their conquerors. Yet, They had not only welcomed the gospel message, but had done so with joy. So, this Bible joy can apparently exist even in the midst of suffering. And that is because, A, the Bible is realistic about the hardships of life. And B, the biblical word translated rejoice carries with it an additional insight. The root of the word is connected to the root for the word we translate as grace. Rejoice in the Bible means to experience, to be conscious of, and to delight in God's grace. And that is something we can do even in the midst of heartbreak or hardship. As Paul closes what might be one of the earliest writings of the New Testament, rejoicing is just the first of the three commands. He wrote, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. All three commands are to be done always, continually, and in all circumstances. Now, unless this is a command to quit our daily commitments and responsibilities, rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks are things we should be doing as we work, as we care for our family our community, our world. We carry our awareness of God's gracious presence with us into everything we do, all the time that we are doing it, and no matter what the situation might be in which we are doing it. 
we are to live in the gracious presence of God. I'm thankful that the Bible doesn't tell us to obey these commands in our own strength. Paul was well aware of his own and our own incapacity to bridge the gap between what is and God's will for us. So our pericope ends with Paul's blessing for the Thessalonians and for us if we'll receive it. He wrote, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. In a later letter to the church at Philippi, Paul also wrote, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. That's why in Psalm 23, the psalmist can say, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you, talking about the Lord as a shepherd, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so, brothers and sisters, I'm speaking also to myself here. Wherever life finds us at this moment, may God himself, the God of peace, open our eyes to his loving, merciful, and gracious presence, even in our dark valleys. May God open our eyes to see that he is there with us. And with that knowledge, even in these times, may we find reason to rejoice. Amen.